March 9, 1997, Los Angeles, California. Just after midnight, superstar music artist Biggie Smalls, aka the Notorious B.I.G., was shot while in the passenger seat of an SUV. The assailant pulled up alongside Biggie in a Chevrolet Impala and attacked. Biggie was rushed to the hospital but passed away shortly after arriving. He was only 24 years old. This came just six months after rival rapper Tupac Shakur was also shot and killed, and no one can deny the connections and implications of both murders happening so close together. No suspect has ever been arrested for Biggie's murder, despite the fact that many consider the case solved. And therein lies where the case takes a strange turn. The murder of Biggie Smalls is shrouded in conspiracy theories and rumors, and the truth may lie somewhere in the middle of gang violence, police corruption, and personal rivalries. Today, I speak with an expert on the Biggie Smalls case. This is A Study of Strange. Welcome to the show. I'm Michael May, and normally uh, I tell a story to someone that doesn't know the case that we're talking about very well and do some reenactments, explore some theories. But today I'm doing it differently because I'm not an expert on Biggie Smalls, but with me is Michael Dorsey, who I just called Dorsey, but I, I, not everybody calls you that, right? <laughs> Dorsey is a bit surprising how many people call okay. me Dorsey, actually. Like I'm on a team. It's really weird. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, so Dorsey is a, he's a filmmaker, documentarian. He's uh, a co EP and showrunner on um, Ghost Adventures House Calls on Discovery yeah. Plus. If I'm, my mind blanked for <laughs> one split second there. But in, for today's topics, though, you're you've become well known as like a, a Biggie Smalls expert in terms of his murder and everything. Right. So how did that come about in your career? So when I first moved to L.A., I lived maybe a couple blocks away from where he was killed, which was the intersection of Wilshire and, and Fairfax in Los Angeles, right outside the, the Peterson Automotive Museum. So I always knew that was like one of the first things I knew about my neighborhood was that's where that happened. Right. And so uh, fast forward, you know, a decade, um, I uh, came across a, a book called Murder Rap that uh, from a detective named Greg Kading, who had been a senior detective uh, for the LAPD for a hom robbery homicide division. Mm -hmm. And he had led a task force for a few years in the late aughts and he uh, solved the case, essentially, I, I believe. He solved both Biggie and Tupac's murders, and he got confessions to both Yeah, uh, yeah. part of his task force. So when I read that book, I just felt like this feels real to me. My bullshit meter is not going off. Yeah. And I, I had done other true crime before. My first documentary was about the Manson family called uh, The Six Degrees of Helter Skelter. So I grew up in a law enforcement family. So crime is like... I tell people my bedtime stories were true crime stories. Right, So right. I, it's always been something that interested me. So... When I came across it and learned that I would have access, you know, pretty much unfettered access to the case files for, you know, 15 years or, or 20 yeah. years of big investigations, I was like, yeah, right, let's do that. So that's yeah. how I became. And now, you know, I would say on the Biggie and Tupac murders, I'm top by the number three or four leading expert in the world. <laughs> You're on only the number cases, three? On I, the cases. Yeah. Well, behind the detectives, honestly, the <laughs> yeah. detectives that have led the case. Yeah. <laughs> So I made the documentary Murder Rap, which right. came out in 2015, mm -hmm. uh, which was about the Biggie and Tupac murder investigations. And then uh, a few years later, we were contacted by a producer. He was a senior writer and producer on Suits, mm -hmm. uh, this guy named Kyle Long, and he wanted to adapt it into a, a scripted series called Unsolved. Great. Now it became Perfect. the scripted series called Unsolved yeah, yeah. Uh, over at NBC Universal, And we produced it for USA Network and... Um, Netflix, which mm -hmm. is, it's on Netflix now. And that stars Josh Demel and Jimmy Simpson and Bokeem Woodbine and just a fantastic cast. Yeah, it was, it, honestly, it was good research for me. I typically like <laughs> to read when I research stuff, but it was really nice to actually turn something like that on and go for it. Uh, another bit, not to, not to stroke your ego too much, <laughs> sure. but you created a little bit of a YouTube series just a year ago, mm -hmm. um, which has gotten a lot of views on YouTube. I'll link to it in the show notes, but it's fantastic. And that's where you dive into some of the other things that I guess haven't 
gotten as much time or attention, yeah. right? Yeah, it's called Deep Dive, and I ended up doing it with Vlad TV, um, which they a nice big network uh, or channel on YouTube. Um, and it, yeah, it was all the tangential little interesting side stories mm-hmm. that we never had time to get into in the other projects I did that always interested me. And I was like, I, I'm, I want to put these out there. So it's, yeah, yeah that's what it is. It's these really and, interesting deep dives. And they're super stuff. entertaining and they're, they're short. They don't take a lot of time to get mm-hmm. into, but they're very entertaining. And honestly, for people interested in this case, it, yeah. it was really kind of enlightening for mm-hmm. someone like me that doesn't know them very well. <laughs> right. Um, so what we'll do today, uh, I'll give a little bit of background on the case. Uh, we're going to focus more on Biggie, but you can't mm-hmm. talk about Biggie without talking about Tupac as well. Right. So we will dive into a little bit of that. Um, and then I'm just going to ask you questions on things and have you talk because sure. I am I am not an expert on this case. In fact, I I am I don't listen to hip hop. Like this has not really hmm. been in my orbit. However, growing up in that era and being around when the hip hop sort of boom happened in the mm-hmm. 90s, even me who doesn't listen to that and I was away studying theater and I was so far <laughs> away from pop culture that like I didn't even I basically would watch reruns of Seinfeld later, but I didn't watch Friends. I didn't <laughs> right. like I wasn't into the the current music. But even the West Coast, East Coast, West Coast rivalry, Biggie, Tupac, they're still on my radar, even though I didn't listen to them. Like these guys were so big and right. so important to pop culture, and so I, I was well aware of the rivalry and mm. when both of them both of them were were sadly murdered but i still never knew much about it so right. it is really interesting to kind of start to to learn about these stories and they are strange i mean this is the study of strange after all so i do want to ask you some of the more uh, maybe not salacious isn't the right word sure. but some of the details of the case that are kind of conspiratorial in a way yeah. there's a lot of theories out there a lot of people say hey these are these are solved but mm-hmm. you just can't do anything about them right an obvious place to start then at this moment is who is Biggie Smalls? And he was born Christopher George Latour Wallace in 1972 in Brooklyn, New York. A uh, very talented guy. I've seen his his mother interviewed and she seems really cool. Yeah, she's great. Yeah, like his mom is so fa- fascinating and, and just lovely. Um, and however, Biggie got involved selling drugs at a very young age. I think he was like 12 or 13. <laughs> is that right? So, yes, something like something that, yeah. like that. Okay, um, and he signed his first sort of foray into professional music as he signed with Puffy P Diddy. I'm going to call him every name tonight, mm-hmm. so I may just clarify Puffy a lot, but we all know who he is. Yeah, uh, he signed with Puffy at Uptown Records. Puffy, I think, was let go from Uptown Records, and Biggie followed him to Bad Boy Records, uh, which is really important. The Bad Boy Death right. Row rivalry here. So at one point in time, Biggie was friends with Tupac Shakur, but they had a falling out. Do you know much about their falling out? Yeah. Okay. So Tupac got famous before Biggie did. um, And as a result of that, but then they became fast friends. Mm. And so Tupac was ahead of Biggie career wise and Tupac was helping him out. He was advising him. I think at one point Biggie supposedly wanted Pac to manage him. Oh, wow. And, uh, and, but Pac would bring him up on stage at his own shows just to promote him and get Mm -hmm. him, you know, uh, get him seen by other people. And, uh, and then, yeah, it was really, that's one of the things that makes this this, like a Shakespearean tragedy. Yeah. That these guys really were really good friends. Yeah. And the falling out they had was, was happened the first time Tupac was shot. Right. Right. Yeah. Tupac, uh, Tupac blamed Biggie. And I guess some of Biggie's friends, too, is, is sort of crew for having knowledge of a shooting that, that Tupac was obviously involved in and got hit like four or five times. Yeah, I believe. he was a, there was a Quad Studios recording studio in uh, Times Square area of New York. And Tupac was going there to record track a track for somebody, for an artist. And um, as he was walking in, coincidentally, he looks up and he sees some of Biggie's entourage, Lil Cease, Biggie's cousin, who was one of his backup, you know, backup guys. Um who, who looked down and saw him like, oh, Tupac, Pac, come in. They're still friends at this point. Yeah. And so Pac's like, oh, cool. And in the lobby, two guys ambush him and he gets shot as a result and, and survives. Mm-hmm. But he ends up blaming Bad Boy and, and the, the whole crew up there with Biggie and them for yeah. either, I think initially he thought that they set him up. And then later on, I think he just thought, well, they knew about it and didn't warn him. Right. But I think the truth really is that Biggie did try to warn him off of some of the people he was associating with Mm -hmm. in new york that biggie knew were bad news and tupac whatever reason didn't heed those warnings and he got you know he got kind of got sent a message i think when he was shot but that unfortunately that permanently destroyed their their friendship yeah and and just as a as a side note to clarify because not everybody 
knows these guys as well as I just assume everybody does. But Tupac Shakur, very famous rapper, artist, uh, actor, actor. He was he was an amazing actor, I thought. Um, And he was with uh, at the time he was signed with Death Row Records, which is run by Suge Knight, who's a bit of a a legendary uh, character, not only back then, but even now. So he ended up signing with Death Row after he was shot. Oh, really? Yeah, because he was in the middle of a court case at the time for which he went to prison. Oh, And it's while he was in prison and he's stewing because he's just he's been betrayed by Mm. he thinks by his friend. And now he's in jail and he wants to get out. And that's when Suge Knight enters the picture. Yeah. And arranges, gets the funds together to get him out of jail. Wow. Okay. Uh, and that's how that's, and then, and it's like, but it's, you got to do three albums for Death Row yeah. as a result. And because Suge Knight had his own rivalry going with Puffy over the murder of his friend that had happened in the summer of 95, mm-hmm. that he blamed on members of, of people that were associated with Bad Boy Records, he had his own feud with them. And so now it's like two guys that have a common enemy basically are teaming up. Right. Which, right. you know, Tupac joining Shug. So who was Tupac signed with before Death Row? Do you uh, know? Well, Interscope, I believe. He okay. Was, okay. Uh, because he, he, he came out of, uh, he was a backup mm-hmm. uh, performer for Digital Underground. Mm-hmm. And then he released his first album, uh, Tupacalypse Now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which in, I've always loved. Layton, <laughs> which is a great title. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So. Cool. Cool. And that, and that makes sense, uh, Interscope, because Interscope is really big and Tupac was kind of exploding. And yeah, uh, yeah that, that actually makes a lot of sense. So Tupac ended up getting shot himself. And the way that kind of went down, again, we're going to focus more on Biggie, but these are intricately tied together. On the night of September 7th, 1996, Tupac Shakur, he... He was with Suge Knight in Vegas, and they went to the Mike Tyson versus Bruce Seldon fight at the MGM Grand. And after the fight in the lobby of the MGM Grand, uh, Tupac, his crew, they get in a fight with um, a guy named Orlando Bobby Lane Anderson, who was a member of the Compton Southside Crips. Yeah, ba- baby Lane, yeah. Baby, what did I say? Ba- you said Bobby. Oh, man, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, yes, Orlando Baby Lane Anderson. And Compton Southside Crips, for those geographically sort of unaware, Compton is in Los Angeles. So this yeah. is an L.A. LA uh, gang. And after the scuffle, Tupac and Suge, and I'm kind of skipping over things, but these are sure. just the basics. Tupac and Suge, they leave the MGM at around 11.15 p.m. And while they're in a car on Las Vegas Boulevard, the main, the main strip in Vegas, they get stopped at a light and a white Cadillac pulls up next to them. Window rolls down, shots ring out. And Tupac was hit four times. Suge was also hit in the head, I believe. Yeah, so the shooting happened after they turned off the strip. They were about a Mm -hmm. mile off. They were at Flamingo and Koval, which is kind of the next big street off the strip. That's interesting to hear because most people... (laughs) I I just read about it last Yeah, people will say it's on the strip. It wasn't. It was about a mile off the strip. Oh, wow, okay. I'm still, you know, strip-ish. Yeah. (laughs) Strip adjacent. Uh, But they uh, they were hit. And yeah, uh, uh, Suge was hit possibly by a piece of shrapnel Mm. or something. He was nicked in the back of the head. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and on September 13th, which is six days later, Tupac died, and he was only 25 years old. And so Biggie was 24, mm-hmm. Tupac 25, and, and that just it that blows my mind that they were so young. Looking back now, that we're older. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, right? yeah. You you know how yeah. young that is now. Yeah, oh man, crazy. they were just they were babies. They were yeah. just babies, and, yeah. and so so talented. It is it's really so um, sad. So. Yeah, and much like Biggie's, Tupac's case has never been solved. Or officially. Th- officially, yes. <laughs> yes. Um, do you want to go into any of the theories for Tupac's case, or should we just move on to the night of, of Biggie's murder? Do you want to? Are there it's any funny, worth mentioning? There really aren't any good conspiracy theories with the yeah. Tupac case worth mentioning because it's so obvious that it was Orlando Anderson, right? And the mountain of evidence against Orlando Anderson is so, and his his uncle has repeatedly right come publicly yeah. stated mm-hmm. that it was that he, he does he tries not to say it was his nephew now but he will say yeah. it was them you know his nephew was with them when it happened but mm-hmm. he, he confessed to greg kading and his task force this this uncle did, yeah and said that in in the task force in this what was called a proffer session he told him yeah orlando pulled the trigger so right. and every and it's what i always tell people what you think happened who you think did it you were right <laughs> is basically because everybody it, Orlando was the prime suspect from day one because the MGM fight with him was on tape. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I think everybody's and, seen it. And too, he's so. a, he was a legit gangster. Yeah. And had uh, was suspected of committing other murders, you know, mm-hmm. sh- uh, gun related murders. And this is exactly how someone like that would respond to getting beat down in front of, yeah. you know, a bunch of people. 
yeah like that and it's look i i tend to drift into whenever something's quote unquote unsolved i tend to drift mm-hmm. into whatever the, the simple explanation is yeah. i tend to think is Occam's right. razor yeah. exactly and uh, yeah or, or orlando um he definitely seemed like the guy from the little bit i know but there i'll just maybe i'll mention just a few of the weird ones sure. because it, a lot of people have it affects their belief on biggie's death yeah but like one theory is that biggie was behind the murder and mm-hmm. there's this weird story that he's paid a million dollars and wanted to use his own gun to have tupac shot mm-hmm. uh, which i think is just bonkers that biggie there's like that biggie was in vegas when it happened that was one of the, right part of that theory right. yeah um so now the uncle that confessed he did say that that there was a connection and there was money offered it oh, just it wasn't from it just wasn't from biggie Okay. Um, but it was not what made the, the you know, was not the, you know, why, why they why did it that happened. night. They yeah. were just there to have fun and party like everybody else was. Cause yeah. it was fight night in Vegas. And it's Mike Tyson. It's, you know, that's what you're there yeah. to do. It just happened that, you know, when Tupac punched Orlando Anderson, it instigated that it was going to happen that mm. night. Okay. Well, cool. Well, let's, um, th- if anybody is interested <laughs> to see the theories behind Tupac's uh, murder, maybe what I'll do is link some of them, some pages to them in the show notes. Because... I mean, the Tupac is alive is probably the most yeah, prominent uh, counter theory. Of he course. was never murdered in the first place. Yeah. And what's uh, funny about that is I've gone down the rabbit hole on that a little bit. And like, there's always, there's, there's claims that what people will make to back up their theory. And if you accept those claims as true, then you're like, Oh, well that sounds kind of plausible. Mm-hmm. And like one of them, one of the claims is that the, the coroner who did his autopsy disappeared Oh, afterwards oh, where did, did he go hear that one. and so that kind of sounds suspicious and then um one time i was like i'm gonna look that up and yeah. no he did not <laughs> he was the coroner for vegas for many many years he continued to be the coroner for vegas for years afterwards right there's you know local newspaper articles about when he did finally retire it was a you know it was a big deal because he'd been the coroner there for i think at least a couple decades and it's like that's the kind of thing where like you you have to you know, they say, do your own research. You need to look this up and like when yeah. people claim things, yeah. you need to like make sure, well, first of all, is what they're claiming, is that actual a fact? Yeah. Yeah. And, and look, not to go on a tangent here, but this is why I love these kind of stories and the kind of <laughs> stories that I, I want to tell in a podcast, which is research, especially the more time between when something happened and when people are diving into research. Now with the internet, research means something entirely different Mm. but popular conspiracies popular theories they don't have to be conspiracies um word of mouth it's like it changes what truth is Mm -hmm. and so it's always fascinating to see that even with a current like this is not that long ago that this happened you already start to see that of like oh well you know the guy in vegas he disappeared and it's right people just did you yeah did you look him up because no he didn't (laughs) It's uh, like it's like do your own research now is like jump to a conclusion and yeah. then find other people who have jumped to that same conclusion. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I, all I, agree with each other. So let's get into Biggie's death. Yep. This was the, the night of March 8th, 1997. And Biggie, along with Puff Daddy, attended the Soul Train Awards after party, which was hosted by Vibe, right? Vibe magazine, yeah. Because yeah. the, the Soul Train Music Awards had been the night before on the 7th. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So this was, the, even though it was the next night, it was still billed as an after party. Uh, and a lot of people that were at the Soul Train Awards were, were at, at the, the party. party. Yeah. yeah, and the party was at the Peterson Automotive Museum on Wilshire Boulevard, which I know intimately well. We've been there many times, <laughs> many times, <laughs> yes. uh, which happens to be close by Death Row Records office, which right. is, I mean, maybe a mile away, if that. Like, it's well, not just far west away. of there. Yeah, yeah. After midnight. The morning is now of, is that March 9th? Is that when they claim it? It's yeah. now, so March 9th is what's on his death certificate because he was declared dead at like 1.15 a.m. Cool. You know, uh, technically it was now the 9th. Right. But the party was on the 8th. Right. So yeah. the morning now of the 9th, the fire marshal actually shut down the party because uh, it was too crowded, I guess. Too crowded, too rowdy. Yeah, you know. they just, they, they they were not prepared for how many people showed right. up. Right. And um, security at the door was tough because people showed up without you know invitations, uh, invitations and they were and... so there were people outside that were stuck that were mad that couldn't get in that mm-hmm. didn't leave and yeah it was it was a, a scene right so so the party gets shut down and biggie and his group they make their way downstairs to the parking garage and the parking garage because i know this museum mm-hmm. so so well mm-hmm. is basically the front door so yeah. they go down to the parking garage they're waiting on their car and they eventually 
they get into three cars, uh, Biggie and his crew, right? And all bright. Were they all Blazers? No, they were uh, Biggie and, and Puff got into a pair of Suburbans. Okay. And then there was a Blazer, a follow That vehicle. followed them. They had uh, With the some security. more security people yeah. in it, yeah. So Biggie gets in the passenger seat of the Suburban, um, and they pull out. They're on Fairfax Boulevard, mm-hmm. and they're headed north, and they get stopped at a stoplight, and a black Chevy Impala... Ooh, I'm already being told. Ooh, I'm getting the look from Dorsey. So yeah, so tell See, me. See, this is how you wander yeah. into conspiracy and yeah. don't even realize it. Uh, it, it. Some described it as black. Others described it as dark green. Nice. So it depends on which witness to it you, you see. Yeah. But I think the closest witnesses to it said it was dark green. The ones that were farther away thought it was black. Oh, that's really interesting. And dark green was one of the stock colors that you could get that yeah, year that of Impala. Impala in. What year was it? It was uh, it was described as mid ninety. Okay. So it was believed to be either a ninety five or a ninety six. And cur- so current at the, it was at a, the time. Yes, exactly. Wasn't a classic. Yeah. Uh, Impala, no. Great. So the uh, again, Biggie is sitting in the passenger seat. This car comes up on his right, the Impala, and shots ring out. Shots ring out. Sounds so funny. It's the second time I've said that today, but shots happen. Yes. Um, and Biggie is shot. Uh, how many times is he He's hit? hit four times. Four times. And and all survivable except the last shot. And that's the tragedy. Oh, man. Oh, so the last shot is a fatal one. The final shot hit like four major man. organs. His heart is long. Yeah, it was. Uh, and it was a nine millimeter pistol. Correct. And we can get into the details. Yeah. There, is, there is a detail about that that I learned from you. Yeah, sure. Uh, about that. And uh, witnesses claim the Impala driver was an African American male dressed in a blue suit and bow tie. Is that correct? So yeah, far? some thought he was dressed blue, and some thought he was in, it was like a gray or cream colored. Okay. And it is night, so it's you, exactly. you can understand. Again, how colors it's under the yeah. lights, everything looks just, just yeah. like with the car color. Yeah. Uh, Biggie was rushed to the Cedar Sinai Hospital, but he was pronounced dead at one fifteen a.m. And again, he was only twenty four years old. Yeah. So. That is the the basic synopsis of you got some Tupac in there because they're tied to de- together and connected in a lot of ways. That's how how Biggie was shot, and obviously, again, officially, this is not solved. Um, so I'd love I don't have a specific thing I wanted to start with to, sure. to ask you questions, but there are a couple of theories I'll just mention real quick. I won't even say the whole theories, but Suge Knight, his name comes up. Mm-hmm. And a lot of different theories. Pretty much every theory yeah. somewhere kind of goes back to him. Yeah. Yeah. And Suge Knight, again, is the head of Death Row Records right down the street, West Coast, you know, yeah. the whole West Coast, East Coast rivalry. Yeah. Um, Suge is currently incarcerated, right? He yeah. is currently right now incarcerated, and he was yeah. also incarcerated at that time. Oh, man. Because coincidentally, the, night, the beat down of Orlando Anderson. Mm hmm that preceded Tupac's murder by two hours, mm-hmm. uh, Suge got sent back to prison because of that. Because on the video, you can see him giving a little kick yeah. as you know all the yeah. guys pile on. And that violated his own, his own release prob- terms yeah. at that point, And he got sent back to prison. Yeah. Right. And so this is only six months or so after yep. Almost Tupac exactly was shot. six months. Man. Yeah. And uh, there are some people that also think Puffy was involved himself, even though he was part of Biggie's mm-hmm. team. What is that? What is, I've never quite understood the Puffy That's theory. probably the most far out of all yeah. the theories, because why would you kill your own number one artist whose right, album right. is about to come out? Yeah, I guess some people think that because his star as an artist rose in the aftermath of that, oh, with the whole so I'll like be missing you and stuff, involved. maybe people thought that he was a chance for him. But I yeah, I think it's so ridiculous. Yeah, that, that one's super ridiculous. And then there are a lot of theories that I've, uh, these are, are the ones that actually intrigue me the most, which is how... Uh, May have been corruption, may not be the right mm-hmm. word, but cops. And, yeah, the dirty cops theory. Dirty yeah. cops theory. I don't know. Which one do you want to start with? Are there any of these you want to dive into? What can you clarify for us? Well, the dirty cops theory has been done to death. Mm-hmm. Um, that one uh, was, uh, there was an investigator named Russell Poole mm-hmm. who came along about a month after the murder happened. Um, and it, originally the murder case was with Wilshire Division homicide detectives because that was their territory where they, right where they, it was their area um but after you know a month of them not you know solving it uh robber homicide division which is kind of the elite murder homicide division for right. la really it's more like they they get the high profile cases yes of course they came in and took over the case yeah and russell Poole was one of the junior detectives on that um he was fairly new to robber mm-hmm. homicide when that happened um and he ended up developing a theory um Gosh, probably about nine months later, 
where he he <laughs> the whole basis of it is just so crazy to me but he I'm trying to remember the order of events that he found things out so first what happened was i think it was that summer there was a schizophrenic jailhouse informant named Psycho Mike. <laughs> Definitely a guy you want to listen to. Uh, Michael Robinson, Michael Ro- Psycho Mike yeah. Robinson. He um, he said that he he was inside when it ha- when the murder happened. He was in prison, so he's mm-hmm. all he's repeating what he thinks are rumors or w- w- what he's hearing. And he heard that the uh, the shooter was a guy named Amir or Ashmir or Kenny or Kiki, which Kenny or Kiki sounds like Kefi, who's Kefi, Orlando which, Anderson's. Yeah. yeah uncle uh-huh. <laughs> who confessed that Orlando killed Tupac and or Keefe D was also at the at the party, party right? that night. Yeah. He was at both places. Yeah. And Keefe was actually, you want to talk about another theory. Keefe was actually looked at yeah. for a while as well. I, I actually had him highlighted on this screen so right here. It kind of sound, when he, so, <laughs> so what I think Michael Robinson was doing was he was throwing a bunch of names against the wall Yeah, and, you know, hoping cause he, he, he would snitch for money basically. Yeah. And he, I think he had a son that was kind of, you know, he, he tried to provide for and that was, how he made money. Oh, wow. He was paid wow. to inform. And if he didn't have information, the money stopped. And now he's stuck in jail and hard for him to inform, be a street informer when he's not on the street anymore. Yeah. So he starts throwing all these, to, and he describes the guy as a uh, as a, a bodyguard for the Crips, and the guy rolls around in a white limousine in Compton. And he's got some very specific information on who this guy is. Um, so I think Russell Poole kind of keeps that information in the back of his mind. But the, the detectives that went out and talked to Psycho Mike, they thought he was full of shit. Right, they, right. This guy doesn't know what he's talking about. So they didn't take him seriously. So then fast forward uh, later that year, uh, this cop named David Mack robs a bank. <laughs> LAPD <laughs> cop robs a bank, gets, I think, $722,000, okay. major haul. Yeah. Uh, and it turns out his his girlfriend was in on it. She worked at the bank. Yeah. And she made sure that there was extra funds there that day. And so because of that, he gets busted. He gets taken down. And so that was not Russell Poole's case. He had nothing to do with the David Mack case, but he mm-hmm. ended up Mack ended up going to jail for I think about a decade, a little more maybe. Yeah. And so but he but he checks the visitor logs for David Mack and he sees a guy who visited him named Amir Muhammad. And so and David Mack, the, this cop that did the bank robbery, owned the black impala. Yeah. And so this, he starts putting two and two together. Yeah. Oh my God, this the Amir guy is the guy. The problem is, is that Amir Muhammad uh, was a, a mortgage broker uh, at the time. Yeah. I think he was living in in the Inland Empire, and then shortly thereafter, he moved down to like the San Diego area. Uh-huh. And uh, he's a mortgage broker. He's a professional. Yeah. He, he he it's it's kind of silly, and he does not match at all. He's not from Compton probably knew nothing about Compton. Mm-hmm. Uh, the idea that he was rolling around Compton in a white limousine and providing bodyguard services for Crips. Yeah. You know, and, and then, you know, it like moonlighting doing that as a mortgage yeah. broker is just like, it didn't match any of the stuff that Amir Muhammad's or that a uh, psycho Mike said. Yeah. Yeah. It's just the name Amir. One of five names he gave. He, he makes this connection. So it's a coincidence. And then it's kind of like drawing a conclusion and then going, working your way backwards and right. trying to find all the evidence. It's the confirmation bias that it, that happens 100%. to everybody. Yeah, exactly. Uh, although I don't fully trust mortgage brokers, so I should uh, <laughs> mention that. Well, what's ironic, you want to talk about trust. One of the reasons that Amir, um, that they turned on to Amir was that he, when you log in to visit someone in jail, you have to visit, fill out a form with your mm-hmm. information, your name, uh, your address, social security number. And um, his name and his address were correct from his DMV file, but his social security number, he put down a fake number. Oh. And that, oh, he's trying to hide who he is. Oh. And Amir, he was later interviewed, um, and he said that, that no, it's just as a mortgage broker, he's had a lot of clients that have had their identity stolen. Okay. And he was, so he's mindful of it. And now he's like, I'm going into a jail that's full of criminals being visited by other criminals. And here's this logbook that anybody can look at. I'm yeah. not putting all my personal information down, and especially not putting my social security number down. But all his other information was correct, which is why they were able to easily find him. So the idea that yeah. he was hiding his who he was is ridiculous. Yeah. And I'm already starting to get the sense of like Oliver Stone's JFK, where <laughs> suddenly there's all these different people that are somehow connected to something that right. like it's starting to to get a little crazy already and it gets, crazy. It's like throw a bunch of things against the wall and see what sticks. Yeah. With and, this theory. Yeah. But let me ask this though, because uh I, one of the the things I wanted to bring up with you is there's the wrongful is it the wrongful death the wrongful action case wrongful death up. lawsuit yeah so but didn't that have there was files released with some sort of police they didn't do their job correctly or was it, what was that no there was one thing they made a big deal out of was that one of the, when you know when that lawsuit happens the LAPD had to turn over a bunch of the case files right. for discovery basically uh, to the 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 lawyers who were suing the city. 
And uh, there was apparently a tape found, a taped interview found in the drawer of one of the detectives that wasn't turned over. And that got blown up into this big conspiracy. Got it. So the, it, so because the There's tape cover was missing, up. it's a cover-up. Right. The police are in on it. Right. They were part of this, or some of them were part of it. Mm-hmm. Okay, that actually makes sense to me now. Yeah. Now I kind of understand that world. Has that ever been uh, resolved, that, that wrongful... Yeah, so what happened was uh, when Greg Kading led his task force, he got a confess. He they per- first pursued the, the Russell Poole theory as if it was true because it mm-hmm. was the most prominent theory at that time, yeah. and they just because of the this just the ridiculousness of Michael Robinson's what he was saying and these other jailhouse informants. It was really built on the backs of jailhouse informants all telling different stories or all trying to communicate with each other and coordinate what story they were going to tell. They just quickly ruled it out as implausible. And yeah. another thing they did was the, they said, that, you know, David Mack, when he got arrested for the bank robbery, you know, they said that there was a shrine to Tupac in his garage. It wasn't a shrine. It was some like CD. It was like a poster and some like CD inserts, right. which uh, at the time he was just a fan. Yeah. Just at the time anybody that was would, so normal. It was like his garage was like his little workout area. And yeah, it was not anybody's locker we would have called a shrine back then based on that criteria but it got turned into a shrine um they also claimed that this special ammunition that was used is called gecko ammunition yeah was the nine millimeter ammo Mm -hmm. that was used to kill biggie it's actually submachine gun ammunition it's high powered oh wow Uh, you really you you can shoot it in a handgun obviously the shooter used a handgun uh if you use it too much on a handgun it will start to beat the hardware up yeah. It's very hard on your guns because it's really made for machine guns. Right. Um, but it can be fired from a handgun. Uh, so they claimed that this this special gecko ammunition was found in David Mack's house. Mm-hmm. Now, the the actual detective on the case uh, was contacted recently and, and said, no, it was just generic 9mm. And I have the report from the raid on David Mack's house, and it's, it just says 9mm. It does not say gecko. And they also claimed that police radios were used to coordinate the shooting when it happened oh, and that a police and that police radios were found in David Mack's house also that were, yeah. you know, he wasn't supposed to have. Uh, the truth was there was only one radio found, which hard to communicate with only one. And it was uh, reported missing months after. Wow. Two Biggie was killed. So it, it just, it's these things. It's again, if you only give people part of the information, it's you put them all together. It sounds like a mountain of evidence, mm-hmm. but when you start looking at each one individually, I mean, honestly, this is uh this is really interesting. It's kind of, boggling my mind a little bit because as someone who's only kind of I dove into this over the last week just to prepare <laughs> to talk to you and not trying to solve anything or go sure. crazy but still reading a lot you're already making it sound way more simple and as I said earlier I think simple explanations work mm-hmm. and you're just clarifying that you're not making it simple because of the way you're saying it you're, you're making it simple because you're clarifying a lot of these details that I didn't have right and because I've been reading real trusted news and articles it yeah. does make me realize you know even with good trusted sources you are not getting all the information it's just uh, there's, kind of impossible to there's sometimes. yeah there's so much minutia with a case like this mm-hmm. that even, even a journalist writing about this typically doesn't know any more about it than you do right so they're just writing what they heard mm-hmm. also so and they and they they will get little minor facts wrong sometimes or yeah they just print something that i know is nonsense but they i, I don't blame them they don't know right. that because they aren't they haven't been living this case for the yeah. past, you know, eight years. So, uh, so let me uh, before I get into kind of your theory and what you've learned over mm-hmm. all your years of of working on this. Um, what is what's another strange? It doesn't have to be a theory, but what are the, some of the strange aspects of this case <laughs> that can make it either hard to pinpoint yeah, sure. or anything else that kind of comes to mind? The reason that the both murders were so hard to solve was because uh, drive by shootings are very hard to solve. First of all, I think only like 40% of murders get solved to begin with. Mm. And drive-by shootings are really hard to solve because there's almost no evidence left behind. Even if someone gets a license plate, you still have to prove who was in the car. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a prominent uh, gang member who was associated with death row around the same time, maybe a year or two later, was murdered. They actually found the van and the driver of the van, but they still couldn't prove who the actual gunmen were that got out of the van and shot the guys. And the guy that, you know, that was the driver of the van, he only knew their street names or claimed to, and they couldn't, and he claimed he didn't know what they were going to do. They were just driving and they just happened to see this guy. And the two guys just got out and shot him. Yeah. And he didn't know what was going to happen. So they couldn't arrest him. And that's it. So to this day that remains unsolved because drive by shootings are really, really hard to solve. Mm -hmm. And people say, Oh, but they found, you know, the bullet casings at the scene. Okay. You still have to have a gun that you think was the murder weapon that you can try to compare it against. Yeah. 
and you know tons and tons of guns were have been tested and they've you know reportedly never found a, a confirmed match right so and, and they happen so quickly mm -hmm. i would imagine and also even though it was a party and people were leaving the party there's a lot of people around the peterson museum it's night street lights make colors look weird you already right. comments about the car and the suit yeah um and also just historically witness testimony is not always the the best piece of evidence to have to try to solve a crime yeah. if you so talk to any sense. law enforcement person witness testimony is always like the worst yeah eyewitness you know accounts are always the worst evidence because people miss see things all the time mm -hmm. and misremember too and misremember yeah. them exactly yeah yeah um Okay, so there was the, the drive-by aspect, but yeah, in terms of any other strange things you want to talk about, was that it? Or you, you know, know what, what was interesting was they, they there was a um, I think it was an America's Most Wanted episode or Unsolved Mysteries. I can't. I think it was America's Most Wanted. They did this case, mm -hmm. and um, just the calls they got in from people oh. were amazing. Oh my goodness! Uh, somebody <laughs> uh, somebody thought that an actor from Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing looked mm -hmm. a lot like the composite sketch of the killer and they should oh, go so look, they should go it. talk to that guy yeah. Yeah. um there were people that claimed they did it and it turns out they were actually in insane asylums thousands of miles away when oh, it happened wow. um there were people that called and said their college roommate did it just as a prank mm -hmm. um there was it, it was uh it just shows how many how much evidence that that and you know the detectives have to follow up on every one of those uh, yeah. things that come in but one good thing came in from that episode and that was somebody called in and said that their daughter was in la and may have video tape of the shooting oh wow and that's where the famous videotape of not the actual shooting itself but the moments immediately before and after shot there on fairfax that videotape came to the police yeah. because of that episode of television that aired. Got so it. there was one really great piece of evidence that came out of you yeah. know, a thousand terrible leads. But did that, that also led to a few more, of course, strange theories or people commenting or trying to come up and solve yeah. it themselves. Like the striped shirt guy, which you have an episode mm -hmm. on your YouTube series about. So what did tell me about the striped shirt guy? So there were two suspicious individuals that Biggie security team clocked mm -hmm. while they were inside the garage getting ready to leave. There was a guy dressed like Nation of Islam, Nation of Islam in a, um, a suit and bow tie. And then there was, but, but that there, the Nation of Islam was, con it was common for them to do security, private mm -hmm. security at events like this. And we do know that there were uh, Nation of Islam members there. And we know that there was one guy in a blue suit and police talked to him. Yeah. And it wasn't a mere moment. Right. Um, but there, that a lot of times they, if you saw guys in, in suits and bow ties in an event like that, you would say, Oh, nation of Islam's here doing security. Uh, but this one guy seemed just kind of set off, uh, Puffy's, uh, uh, security guard, his own personal bodyguard, who was named Eugene deal. He spotted that guy and was a little unnerved by him enough that he pulled his gun out and kind of put it under his arm mm -hmm. to be ready for something to happen. Yeah. And then, uh, but then he went over and told the other Paul offered, who was the head of security for bad boy. Hey, keep an eye on this guy. I think they're doing security, but still like keep an eye on this guy. And Paul Offord's like, Hey, you need to keep an eye on this other guy. That's in this oversized striped pullover collared shirt. Uh, he kind of looks like a gang member and he was, I think he was kind of mad dogging them. Mm -hmm. And at one point I think he, he deliberately walked through their group and kind of a, you oh, know, yeah, F like you an kind of fashion, yeah. you know? Yeah. yeah. And so they, and, and deal was like, Oh yeah, I've seen him too. So there were two guys out there and, um, the striped shirt guy is on the home video. Mm -hmm. You can't identify him, but he's definitely there. Oh, yeah, you, definitely you can clearly see, see he's there. And one of the witnesses who had seen him pointed him out on the video and said, yeah, that was that's yeah. the guy that we were talking about. And then the striped shirt guy just happened to also be spotted when the shooting happened. Mm -hmm. But he was out on the street. And what's so crazy is I, I have this 911 tape from these random people that were driving by the girl in the car said that there was a guy in a striped shirt. It looked like he was crouching down between the parked cars and he was pointing and she couldn't see a gun, but he was pointing like he had a gun. Huh. But we know the shooting wasn't done by someone on foot. It was yeah. a drive by. So we don't know to this day what that guy's involvement, if any was, or if it was just, yeah, you know, she, he was pointing and she thought it maybe it looked like a gun, but yeah, you know, that's one of those weird little, side coincident was he was he part of the team was he there to coordinate with the guy was he did he have a cell phone did he mm -hmm. tell him he's you know biggie's in the second suburb and he's coming down the street right now right and then was there as backup in case yeah anything else happened or was it just completely random he had nothing to do with it yeah and not to to go off course here but i you're making me think of that neighborhood at night which again i know very well <laughs> i used to live right around there as well yeah and 
you, you think Los Angeles, you hear Wilshire Boulevard, which is a main thoroughfare. Mm -hmm. So is Fairfax, uh, the cross street. But at night, it's actually really quiet in right. that area of L.A. Even there's a neighborhood right behind the museum. So if someone's waiting on that that next sort of cross street just south of Wilshire. Yeah, Orange Grove. You yeah. can just you can just hang out there until you see somebody come out of the garage and come up after them. Yeah. And not many people are going to notice you because it is so quiet there. Right. At, you know, 1230 at night. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of those neighbors called the police, too, <laughs> yeah. throughout the night yeah. and heard the gunshot. Heard yeah. there was a random shooting that happened about half an hour before Biggie was shot. Oh, where? So on Orange Grove, on oh. that quiet little residential oh, street wow. right outside the garage, somebody else leaving the party um, got out of his car and there were, he had a gun kind of in the map pocket mm -hmm. of his door and it fell out. And, yeah. and, and he decides, oh no, I better make sure it still works and shoots it, yeah. shoots it off in the yeah. air. Yeah, if like, I had a nickel normal. for every time I've done that, <laughs> you know, I'd have, I'd have so, so much money. 911 calls are already coming in from the museum and the neighborhood and then even more come in when that happens. Yeah. Uh, so people always, one of the conspiracy theories was that that guy was part of the conspiracy, that he did that to draw police away or security away from you know mm -hmm. the other side of the building, which is where the murder happened. Right. Um, but it's, it's, first of all, it's a half hour before it happened. And also there were no police in the area at that point. They, they were trying to get the police to come down there and break the party up. And yeah. supposedly LAPD was like, no way. If we come down, it'll just make it worse. Yeah. Um, so if anything, it brought police to the area, which is the opposite of what they would have wanted. And also what happened was those guys, um, after the shooting happened, uh, Biggie was shot. They drove back around and police by that point had a description and a license plate number for their car. And we're like, wait a minute. And they arrested the guys. Yeah. And so they interviewed him and they, and they were just, they were unrelated to Biggie yeah. in any way. They just, it was just random coincidence. Oh, wow. It's the 90s in Los Angeles. Just, just shooting gun guns shots off. Going exactly. Off. Um, all right. Well, let's uh, let's get into it then. So, all right. what what do you think happened? What have you learned after all these years? And honestly, if you could also let us know what has kind of changed too. Even though you you read mm -hmm. the book and you've talked to people, sure. but like, I'm sure your your perspective has changed over the years. So yeah. Yeah. Well, I threw two things at you yeah, at once. Right. I apologize. <laughs> no, they. Uh, well, I think one of the reasons that the the Biggie, the, Tupac's murder, every the people that did that, mm -hmm. they went home and told everybody. Yeah. The, so within days of Tupac being killed, half of Compton knew who did it. It was the worst kept secret in Compton. And but Biggie's murder was the opposite. It was very close to the vest. Only at maybe you know three or four people in total knew anything about it. Wow. It was kept very very close to the vest, and that's one of the reasons that it was so hard to solve. Yeah. Is because there weren't people blabbing. The streets weren't hearing anything about it they were hearing you know it was it's crazy the amount of noise they heard around tupac's murder was so much more than around biggie's yeah um people it was everybody just guessing who did it with biggie and what ended up happening was uh greg kading and his task force they initially talked to keefe d the mm -hmm. uncle of orlando anderson um originally because they thought he might have had something to do with it because there were rumors that they were owed money by south side mm-hmm which the is Crips, where that, Crips, which yeah. is where that, yeah, his gang, the yeah. Southside Crips, were owed money by Bad Boy Records, and that's, that's where that theory came out about that Biggie had offered the million yeah, dollars for Tupac's Tupac. murder. That's yeah. what the debt was. Yeah. Other people, other rumors were that it was just about security. They provided security and had not been paid for that security, and so that's why. And and that and the theory went that the Southside Crips killed Biggie in revenge because he he refused to pay. Mm -hmm. And so that's why they zeroed in on, after they ruled out Russell Poole, they zeroed in on Keefe because they're like, this guy knows something. Mm -hmm. He was at, <laughs> he's connected to Tupac's, where he was in Vegas when Tupac was killed. And he was at the Peterson Museum when Biggie was killed. Like, what are the odds of that? He has to know something. Yeah. Even if he's not involved, he knows something. And wasn't he also associated with a black Impala as well? Yeah, he had a he, he had an Impala, yeah. yeah. He had a, a black Impala, same years. And and another reason that they zeroed on him was that Impala was found hidden in the backyard of his girlfriend's house in Compton under a tarp. Ugh. And so that was like, oh, they're trying to hide it. Yeah, it doesn't and look good. And what turns out was I think the payments were just behind and they, they was, the repossessors were after it and mm -hmm. it was just off the street for that reason. Interesting. But it, but it's, it shows how something can be made to seem malicious yeah. when you cast, you know, from this perspective of the of the Biggie case. So basically, Big, you know, Keefe came in and what's really interesting is he would tell you, he, he, he spoke very freely to the detectives about where he was when Biggie was killed, you know, what he knew about it, he was very open about that because he knew he had nothing to do with it. He had nothing to hide. 
Um, he was in the garage waiting for his car when the shooting happened. You know, here he saw the people come running in, all that. Um, whenever they would start to talk about how well he knew Bad Boy or anything about Vegas and Tupac, that's when he was like, his you know his attorney would kind of jump in and be like, "We're not here to talk about that." Yeah, yeah. you know, he's putting his he's coming in as a favor to you. He's you know he's putting his life at risk by even talking to you guys. Like you know, that's not what he's here for. Stick to it, the Biggie murder. Yeah. So. Um, so I, I, I really strongly believe that he had nothing to do with Biggie's murder got either. It, got it. In fact, he, um, minutes before the murder happened, before Biggie and them left the party, he walked up to Biggie's table and security kind of stopped him. And Biggie looked over and said, he's cool. I know him. And they let him through. And he came over and um, there was a discussion about, you know, Biggie had all these champagne bottles that were given, gifted to him by the party and he wants weed. So there was a trade was kind of worked out, you know, champagne for weed. And, and, and then also Keefe had a bad vibe uh, at that party. No pun intended. Yeah. He felt like uh, he just, he, he recognized some shady characters that were there that were associated with the bloods and death row records. And uh, he just had a bad feeling about that night. And he offered, um, he talked to Puff also at that table and he offered extra security. He's like, do you want, do you want us to walk with you out of here? And he was told stay away from us mm -hmm. because the, the, um, coincidentally the feds had been, uh, had them under surveillance the night before and bad boy had caught them looking at them. Oh, being wow. spied on the night before, which started this whole rumor that the feds had, had been there the night of the, the biggest yeah. murder and had witnessed it and had, hadn't said anything. Um, which I Jeez. went into in my deep dive series. Yeah. This is all these tangents. Um, but anyways, so Keefe and they said, no, we, you know, basically, no, don't help mm -hmm. us. And then, you know, Biggie got shot. Yeah. Uh, okay. So I, I'm, I am, <laughs> so that's I am, bad. I am the, the source of going into that tangent, but it was, a, it's a really good one because I did want to talk to you more about Keefe D. Um, but yeah, so, so what actually happened? In, so in they zero, Greg Kading and his task force, they ended up zeroing in on uh, one of Suge's baby mamas, one of his ex-girlfriends who he had a, a kid with. Um, and she was someone who had been involved, like his businesses would kind of be under her, her name sometimes to kind of keep things, you know, away from him. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, she was involved in some, you know, white collar stuff and, Basically, they um, she she had been arrested uh, at her house for some things, and they offered to get her out of trouble. Basically, if she would cooperate with them and tell them what they knew, and they did kind of a hail mary pass. But there was this guy named Poochie, mm -hmm. uh, Wardell Faust, whose mm -hmm. who's nickname was Poochie. He was an enforcer from Compton, and he was he was serious about that business. He was uh, he didn't like being photographed. His pictures of him, he always has either sunglasses on or he's covering his face. Um, he was not one to party with all the other gangsters. He was about the business of being in an enforcer. Gang business yeah. of yeah. being an enforcer, yeah. which means killing people mm -hmm. uh, primarily. And uh, had supposedly had done hits before. Uh, and so the theory was she she came out and ultimately confessed that she that she was instructed. Uh, to to go to him and to arrange payment and for him to do the hit on Biggie. And it was that simple. It was between, it was Suge to her to Poochie. Got it. And she uh, supposedly posed as a member of Suge's legal team as like a paralegal or a legal secretary oh. so that she could meet with him at the, in the prison in the attorney client privilege oh. area of the prison, which was not monitored. Yeah. And I think that was in like, there was like an episode of breaking bad. I think where that happens where oh, they go wow. in to meet with somebody and the, and the shady lawyer goes in and the shady lawyer is like sits off to the side and puts headphones on. Yeah. So he can't hear what they're talking about, yeah. but that's basically kind of it. It's, it's, it's a way for him to, to talk about his street business basically without yeah. the law enforcement knowing about it. Okay, so Suge's behind it to some extent then. Um, why hasn't this led to an arrest of some kind? Because that's as far as it went. Um, they, I'm trying to remember how, how it got wound down. Uh, basically, I think what happened was the LAPD was not interested in anything that involved Puffy for starters, mm -hmm. they didn't want to get into anything with the, the, any thing that might implicate him with the, which was where they, because the Greg Kading's task force was simultaneously investigating Tupac because they realized that they were connected. The okay. two murders were connected. Okay. And when Greg Kading's task force started going in the direction of maybe Bad Boy having some involvement in it also in the Tupac case, yeah. that kind of put the brakes on that. Like LA's like, no, 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 we, <laughs> we're not doing that. And then also, um, 
Why wasn't Suge ever prosecuted? That is a good question. Is it because he had a lot of other things? That I think honestly, well, the problem is, is that even if you, even when you have a confession from someone like that, you still need corroborating evidence, evidence yes. to go with it. And yeah. they, they're, Poochie was dead by this point. He was yeah. killed in a, he was killed in his own tribe by shooting. He was the victim of. Mm -hmm. um, so, so it's kind of like, well, the shooter's dead. So who, are you, okay, you're going to try to go after Suge. Well, how are you going to build a case on him? He's, you know. Uh, okay. And you just, he's just, not going to, he's not going to confess to anything. Okay. And I want to just clarify for, for myself, not sure. even for the audience here, but so, so Poochie is the one that actually pulled the trigger. He wasn't like behind somebody else in the car. He's the guy. He, it that was, likely... yeah, it was, it was a, uh, uh, it, it was a single person who pulled off the Biggie murder. Yeah. Yeah. The driver was also the gunman. Uh, yeah. There was no one else in the car with him. Um, and supposedly we have a couple of different witnesses who claim that, that Pucci did own an Impala, that Suge bought him one. Because mm -hmm. Suge would get the guy's cars, yeah. uh, the homeboys. Yeah. That was kind of a perk yeah. for being part of his circle. It makes sense. And yeah. so he, and so they Suge and Pucci both got Impalas. So Suge also owned an Impala mm -hmm. <laughs> of this, mm -hmm. this same make and model. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, interesting. So... I mean that it's still as much as no one was ever prosecuted or anything. It still seems weird, you know. Yeah, yeah, like it, yeah. It's, it's just, just simple. Yeah. Here, go kill him. Here's the money, and yeah. he's dead, and that's it. That's just, that's the case. Do you think anything will ever happen to since Poochie's dead? Do you think anything mm. will ever happen to to Suge in this case? I don't. No. Yeah. I mean, look. I think they're pretty happy with Suge being in prison. Yeah. Possibly for the rest of his life. Yeah. You know, depending on how long he lives, he's yeah. he's doing a long. Tail right yes. now, yes, he is. Uh, for the for uh, for that incident in Compton a few years ago, and um, for uh, Terry Carter, for, uh, a murder, mm -hmm. and um, he, uh, yeah, I feel like hey, it's kind of like when you know, like when <laughs> when when um, OJ went to jail for a long for got that long jail sentence for you know the whole uh, memorabilia thing in Vegas with yes. the you know yes. the end thing. it was kind of like okay. Oh, they got him for that at least. Yeah, you know, yeah, like, yeah. Oh, they got him for something. All yeah, right. I do. I don't think the Biggie case will ever be officially closed. Probably unless mm -hmm. the LAPD just decides it's we're no longer working it. We, it was probably this. It's we're considering it what's called cleared other. Yeah, which means you know even if it was Pucci, we can't prosecute him, and we're never going to get enough evidence to link Suge to it. Right. So, right. Barring Suge it, confessing a deathbed confession from him. Yeah, and know. I bet I, I I bet it helps feed conspiracy theories in both the Tupac and Biggie case that mm -hmm. someone like Pucci ends up being killed as sure. well because I know in Tupac's case I can't remember exactly but weren't a few people that may have been suspects or may have been involved also died just soon yeah, afterwards. Yeah, well, or Orlando Anderson was killed 18 months later in mm -hmm. a shootout over uh, a drug deal, but he instigated the shootout, so it wasn't like he was targeted. Mm -hmm. um, he just he just died. Um, and uh, and then a few years later, uh, DeAndre Smith, who was supposedly in the back seat with him when the shooting happened, uh, also died from health re health related issues. Oh. And then um, in, I want to say 2015, I think, uh, uh, Terrence Brown, who was the, supposedly the driver of the getaway car, oh, okay. of the white Cadillac in Vegas, uh, he died. Uh, he was murdered in a, a marijuana sh dispensary yeah. in Compton and part of a double murder. Him and the shop's owner were killed. Yep. Uh, and that remains unsolved also. Yeah, see, but, that but also it helped conspiracy theory. But also, he had previously been shot multiple times in another incident. His nickname was Lotto because he <laughs> survived being shot like ten times. So <laughs> it's like, so it it, it the product problem is is that it, people with that gang street lifestyle, like those guys mm -hmm. who, who are really about the business, they have short lifespans. Most of them, yeah. The ones that that survive are the ones that get out of it yeah. typically. Yeah. So it, yeah, that is that's something. Also, I never said this up front. Um, but you and I got to work a little bit on autobiography and autobiography cold cases for discovery. Yeah. For, and, uh, that is mysteries with cars. I'm uh -huh. sure the audience has heard me mention something about <laughs> another episode. Uh, Tim was on, uh, uh -huh. an episode, All right, great. but, uh, tell me about the status of the vehicles, at least as much as you know, both the, 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 the blazer or sorry, suburban that, yeah, that yeah. Biggie was shot in and, mm -hmm. and Tupac's. So, um, this, the Tupac was shot in a seven series BMW that was leased to death row records. And Suge was driving. Um, that one was processed by uh, Las Vegas police and then returned to death row. And then it was returned to the leasing company. And that one, I don't know what happened to it in the years, subsequent years, but it is now for sale uh, by a car dealership in Vegas. Uh, but it's been repaired. So I think it was repaired and then sold off, you know, possibly at auction or something. Yeah, and yeah. With the people that bought it never having any idea. Yeah. It's and history. Later. Um, and, but, but so, you know, as a, 
the Bonnie and Clyde car is worth a lot because it's still shot up. Yeah. These guys are trying to sell Tupac's death car for like $1.7 million. Yeah. And it has But it sold. just looks like a 7 Series yeah. BMW. The bullet holes have been repaired. So it's, I mean, it's it's interesting, but it's like, yeah. I think, and they keep raising the price too. Yep. And so I, I kind of feel like it's more there to get people to come in. Yeah. And yeah. to their store and look at what else they have. Yeah. Um, and then uh, Biggie Suburban's an interesting one. So um, this is not a well-known story, but after... After the car was returned, somehow the door with all the bullet holes in it ended up at a body shop like in Van Nuys. And there was and it got back to one of the detectives on the case that it was going to be sold. And they're like, no, we're not letting yeah. that happen. We're, yeah, not you don't want that. Happen. we're not letting it happen to Biggie's mom and, and his family. It's no. And so they went down to that body shop and they took the door into evidence. And I believe to this day the door is in LAPD yeah, evidence. Yeah. And people, I think, have gone down and seen it. Yeah. Uh, and then the Suburban was left there, but they put another door on it and it was sold off. It was auctioned. And again, the people that bought it, this family, they had no idea the history until a few years ago, LAPD contacted them, tracked them down and said, you know, um, we, we've been looking at the case again and we may need the car back. We need your and car, And they were please. like, why? And they were like, for what? And they're like, you have the car that Biggie was riding when he was killed. Yeah. And supposedly there is damage to the passenger, front passenger seat seat belt that they think may be because of the, the, from the, yeah. one of the bullets. I mean, it could be, it's a tear, so who knows? Yeah. But, you know, they've always wondered what did that. Yeah. And that's, that they think that's maybe it. could it. be. It could so, be. and they, they also recently tried to sell the car for a lot of money. Uh, yeah, I don't course. think they got a buyer. I can't remember. Yeah. But yeah. uh, that's interesting. So uh, your takeaway on this whole thing, why why are people still enthralled with the Biggie murder? Uh, excuse me, with Biggie and Tupac's murders? And why do you think it's going to kind of live on? Because I, I think this isn't going to end. I think yeah. there's going to be podcast <laughs> and movies and shows never continuously. End. I just saw this. I think uh, I think FX is doing another Tupac documentary oh, right now really? <laughs> called Dear Mama. It's from the perspective of his mother. Yeah. And their relationship. Yeah. And so it, it's it will never end. I think it's because to have two icons murdered within six months of each other and uh, for them to be still officially unsolved and so many theories and 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 the um, and the fact that they're related, you know, the cases are related. That's I think that's why it's like Black Dog. Yeah, it yeah. just will never. There will always be people fascinated yes. with it. And what's interesting too is you know, like with the Big and Tupac cases, there are different camps of you know theories, and the camps constantly bickering with each other and don't like each other. Yeah. And I know I've noticed the same thing with the Black Dahlia case. Yep. Yep. The same thing. There's yep. different camps and they don't like each other yep. and the, the manson murders yep. the whole, they have their you know it's re any you take any case the it, similarities are pretty striking yes and, and and to the outsiders the bickering seems very petty mm -hmm. and why don't you all just get along and work together yeah but, yeah but, yeah no that's that's awesome but um coincidentally uh, uh uh the tupac case is being looked into again Oh wow! Right now, by Las Vegas police. That's and that's that came out a couple months ago. So oh wow, that's I didn't not know that. Too breaking news, but I, I yeah. can confirm that. Yeah, they are. They are actually looking. Someone, someone's putting some someone manpower is working into it. it. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Well, I, I kind of I hope they solve it. I mean, just I do for too. The sake of it was a crime. I hope it is solved. Well, I mean, Keefe's talked about it so many times, and he put a book out. Yeah, a couple years yeah. ago, uh, called Compton Street Legend. I think something like that. Yeah, and it's like, and again, it's two hundred and twenty-five pages of yeah, yeah we did it. Yeah, but even then, a lot of other people have written things that, like, you can't, you know, as a police officer, you can't just go, well, he said it I in guess, this. Yes, but I, I mean, how many times does one person have to say, yeah, yeah, it was us? Yeah. Before you're like, oh, yeah, it was them. Yeah. But I get it. You got to build a, you got to still build a case. And, you know, another reason that these haven't been solved officially is because, um, you know, people will always say, oh, well, if Justin Bieber was killed on the strip, mm -hmm. they would solve that stuff right away. I'm like, yeah, if Justin Bieber's security team, knew who the murder was they would race each other to the police department to tell yeah. who did it yeah but in, in you know when you're surrounded by you know gang members and there's a street code you yeah don't you don't cooperate with police no and they they didn't well I mean, didn't some tupac of the even a cop showed up when tupac was shot and didn't he the cop was like who shot you and he just said fuck you to the cop that's what right? the cop has claimed yeah, yeah. this vegas bike bike police officer yeah. who was the first on scene and helped pull Tupac out of the car yeah. after the shooting. Yeah. He claims that that's what Tupac yeah. said. Again, stayed true to the code, you know, yeah. till the very end. Yeah. Tupac was such a talented dude and, and so was Biggie. I just know Tupac's work a little right. bit better. And he was also an art school guy. I went to art school. I went to performance <laughs> school. So I, I yeah, always I mean, Tupac was him. in a performing art school yeah. with Jada, Jada Pinkett Smith. That's right. They like, were John, friends. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. Uh, 
Which some people have tied, you know, tried to tie into Will Smith's whole slapping incident. Oh, yeah. Well, because he slapped uh, Chris, <laughs> Chris Rock, Rock, he definitely had something to do with uh, Tupac's murder, I <laughs> no, think. Yeah. That's, no, just that, like, that it was kind of this, like, he had to prove him. He's always felt like he had to prove himself because oh. there was kind of maybe a thing with uh, her and Tupac right. in high school. At least they were friends <laughs> and, you know, Tupac's the gangster all icon right. and, yeah, I got to prove yourself. I don't know that I believe yeah. that yeah. it's that deep. Yeah. <laughs> That but, is that's pretty crazy. And I think I feel like we're kind of done dump, dunking on yeah. Bill Smith. It's been done. Yeah, it has Move been. On. It has. Well, honestly, thank you so much for this. I I know I learned a lot from this because mm-hmm. again, I've been a little removed from this case. I haven't studied it. Um, but I've always been fascinated with it. It's two icons like you said and sort of pop culture history and murder mystery all wrapped up into this. Yeah. And uh it's always fascinated me and I honestly you you simplified it for me i feel like i learned it i feel Uh like you've affected my point of view on the case sure but i still listening to you talk today i mentioned it earlier but you're making me think of oliver stone's jfk because there's (laughs) all those like quick witty good dialogue scenes they're introducing all these various people that are coincidentally may have been associated Mm -hmm. with whatever and And there's there's... some like shadowy underworld figures involved with it and yeah 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 so i think what i my point is oliver stone Friend of friend of the podcast. I, I'm just assuming, but I, I'm sure he listens. Yeah. Uh, but Oliver Stone, I think your next project is right here. I think there you go. Uh, Biggie, Biggie Smalls <laughs> murder. Um, well, let's uh, look. I I didn't want to plug all your stuff up front, but sure. I do want to mention everybody should check out Murder Rap Unsolved. Mm-hmm. They should watch your YouTube videos on the subject. Yeah. Uh, also, uh, Ghost Adventures House Calls of Discovery Plus. Yeah. And uh, what else do you have? Because I feel and, like you're always working on stuff. I think Murder Rap is on iTunes now mm-hmm. and to rent, and I know it's on Peacock. Oh, and awesome. you can actually stream it for free on the Peacock streaming app. Boom. It's part of like the free, you know, just sign up for yeah. a free account. You can watch it there. Awesome. I just found out about that. Uh, I also just finished up a, uh, a documentary on the Parkland school shooting that I was uh, a part of that. I, I came in, I joined it late and re- helped basically re-edit the, the documentary, you know, uh, polish it up. And, uh, and that comes out in early September and it's called uh, Code Red. And where is it going to be? It is they're self distributing, so it will oh, be cool. on you know pay per view on all the yeah, I'm yeah. Sure, iTunes and mm-hmm. Google Play and Amazon and all those Sweet. places where you can rent things. And uh, it's an interesting one because they've really focused on everything that went wrong mm. that day, specifically with like the police response and um, and the way the school reacted. And unfortunately, you know, it's happened again with Uvalde. A lot yeah. of the same mistakes were made all over again. Yeah. So they're kind of that's where they decided to put their focus on for the doc. So it's an interesting right. angle. Uh, do they interview any of the students, like yeah. Dave Hogg or anybody? N- none of the March for Our Lives yeah. guys, but they um, they interviewed two survivors, and they interviewed a survive a teacher who survived, who was in the, the building that was the, where the shooting happened, and they interviewed at least three uh, police officers who responded that day. So they got really good access, and the big mm. thing is they got um, all the sheriff's department body cam footage. Oh wow! That shows wow. what the police were doing. Um, you know, we didn't we don't show any victims or anything yeah. like that. But you you see mainly outside them trying to organize and yeah. figure out what to do. Uh, it's pretty enlightening. How was it editing that project? Because I don't know if I could sit down. It was and, really rough. Yeah, it was rough. And I, I actually reached out to our friend Tim about maybe color grading. Yeah, and he was like, I can't. Oh I man, can't touch that. Yeah, uh, anybody with kids. I don't have kids, so maybe mm. it was not quite as rough for me. Yeah, uh, but it was still hard going yeah going through all the body cam footage which i didn't see anything you know bad um but still hearing you know the the urgency and and the the panic and everything it was it was a dark the first month on working that was pretty dark and then once i kind of i got found everything and i got acclimated to it now yeah i can feel more objective about it but yeah it was well i mean good for you because it's important these things get made so i'm glad i'm glad you can do it you know what's interesting is when um that surviving sugarman mm-hmm. you know that director yeah. of that film he he won the oscar and then okay. he killed himself Oof, i didn't know that he he jumped in front of a train yeah and he jumped in front of a train like a year or two after he won the oscar and you would think you if you win the oscar mm-hmm. especially for something like that you can write your own ticket whatever yeah. you want to do next you can do like anybody will anybody wants to work with you and you would think the guy's on cloud nine mm-hmm. and I think what was reminded to what I got reminded of when that happened was it's a very solitary job. You're in a dark room by yourself all day, every day, especially if you're dealing with rough subject matter. Mm. And I, I did start, it made me more cognizant of my own mental toll that it takes on me. Yeah. And, um, and I don't have any issues with depression or anything like that, but I can see how if you did, 
in which he, I think he had a history of it. Mm-hmm. It's a tough lifestyle. Yeah, it it's is. It's a tough career to pick. Yeah, and, and look, and winning winning an award like uh, the Academy Awards, I I actually know Academy Award winners. I'm in the entertainment industry. Sure. And I have to tell you, I think both of them that I know that have won Oscars have said that the phone calls actually stopped like a week after. It was like... Because people think, oh, you're too big for them You're too big. I think it's a combination of a lot of things. I think (sighs) one is, especially if you're not, if you're not like Tom Cruise, if you're not a big actor. Yeah. If you're one, if you're an editor, if you're a sound designer, you're still just, you know, the the hired hand person. Correct. And it kind of just, you get kind of forgotten about and uh and yeah. so it, it plays it plays tricks on a mind because everybody Maybe, thinks this yeah. is everything i've wanted now i can do anything i mm-hmm. want and then a week later it's just like back to normal you're still you begging your agent for work hard. you and... have to fight just as hard for your next yeah. thing as everybody yeah. else has. I, a friend of mine uh, is this one uh the oscar for sound mm. uh for record sound recording for uh whiplash yeah and i remember i went he had a you know touch tom's oscar party at his house yeah yeah we all went over and got the whole oscar and get our picture taken and uh, but i asked him afterwards and a few months later, I said, about how long did that, the, the glow from how the people treat you differently mm-hmm. from that? He goes, about two weeks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then it was a sound guy. Back back to normal. Back, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I know the life. <laughs> uh, well, look, I, I'm going to bug you later on because you and I share interest in things like Hollywood stories and yes. the history of Hollywood. Oh, your podcast. That was the other thing I was going to mention. Tell everybody about oh, your yeah. podcast. Uh, I do a, a podcast called The Dearly Departed Podcast. We've been doing it now for like three and a half years. Mm-hmm. Uh, with Scott Michaels. Scott runs uh, uh, Dearly Departed Tours, which was in Hollywood, and findadeath.com, and he yeah. has a big following. And um, we do, yeah, we do a show like about once a month. Yeah. Uh, all on dark, the dark side of Hollywood history. We usually pick a story and, yeah. and run with it. And it, it's awesome. Everybody <laughs> should check it out. It's an, uh, obviously a topic that I love. So I want to yeah. get you on to talk about some, some sort of an, Hollywood Scott story. Scott is later an on. encyclopedia of. Oh, I got to get him Hollywood. too. You that should would be amazing. Absolutely. Have Scott oh, I, would lo- I would absolutely love to. He's awesome. Uh, you and I never got to do the Black Dahlia together an autobiography oh. which we spent a lot of time filming we filmed it and we went out to yep. the spot where her body was yep. found and filmed in the More rain than once and, we did. Yep. Uh, <laughs> and you guys never put in an episode of it nope, which is so nope. sad because i feel like we did a really good we, job we did we did a really good job but at least job. uh bauerdorf yeah we got to we got to do that bauerdorf which we were going to tie together into one story yeah uh, but a uh, black dolly i feel like so many people have done it i like to find the the stories not everybody has done so I'll, we'll find something else, yeah. but also because of your work on ghost adventures, I, I'm not really focused on paranormal stories at mm-hmm. all, but it, it will come up. This is a study of sure. strange, so it might be nice to have you on for something I'm like that, too. I just, I love the unknown, whether Me it's too. true crime or whatever. Me too. Yeah. Mysteries, man. <laughs> uh, well, cool. Well, thank you so much, and uh, we'll talk soon. All right. Thank you. And thank you, the listeners, for tuning in to... What I think, I think this is a very special uh, episode we did today. I got to learn something. I could talk about these topics all day long, which is why I have a podcast. Uh, I did not do any housekeeping at the beginning of the episode. Forgive me. I'm new to this. I'm going to forget things from time to time. If you like what we're doing, if you like where this podcast can go, uh, please subscribe, rate, and review. We also have more information, show notes on astudyofstrange.com. We have a Patreon page already with some exclusive content that has already been published, and you can find out more about that through our website as well. If you have comments, if you want to bring up details or information or theories or ideas on any of our episodes, don't hesitate to email at astudyofstrange at gmail.com. Again, that's astudyofstrange, all one word at gmail.com i cannot promise to respond to everything but i do read all the emails thank you all so much find us on instagram keep listening to the show and next week we have the bennington triangle a story i have been wanting to talk about to somebody for many years and i finally put together enough information that i think will make it uh different than any other sort of podcast or videos that you all might have seen about the subject i'm really looking forward to it i hope you enjoy thank you